In the previous video, we talked about the two basic parts of the vertebra, which are the body, also known as the centrum, and the vertebral arch, also known as the neural arch. This video will concern the processes that are going to be found extending from the vertebrae. From this perspective, we can see the spinous process, which extends from the top of the neural arch, and the transverse processes, which extend from the sides of the neural arch at the place where the pedicles meet the laminae. From this perspective, this is a lumbar vertebra, we can see the articular processes. In order to understand how we're going to name the articular processes, we need to understand the proper orientation. Let's look at this figure which shows a lateral view of the vertebral column. The part of the vertebral column that is closest to the skull is cranial. And this part of the column, because we are upright, would be considered superior. The vertebrae that are closest to our tail, so to speak, which we don't really have, only have a remnant of, would be caudal. These vertebrae would be considered inferior. So now as we go along the vertebral column, we can note that the vertebrae are going to change. They're going to have a basic structure, but the structure is going to change as we go from one region of the vertebral column to the next. So now let's look more closely at the articular processes using the thoracic region of the vertebral column. So here we can see the thoracic region and right over here in these locations are where the articular processes are articulating with one another, forming an articulation in other words. Now if we isolate one of these thoracic vertebrae, we note that the articular processes are extending superiorly and inferiorly from the neural arch. And the ones that are extending superiorly are simply going to be called the superior articular processes and the ones that are extending inferiorly are referred to as the inferior articular processes. Now if we take a closer look at the superior articular process of this thoracic vertebrae, we can note that on this process there is a smooth surface. It is relatively flat here and if you were to feel it, it would feel very smooth. And this flat, smooth surface is what is referred to as a facet. The word facet means little face. And the facet indicates a place where a movable articulation was present, where the surface of bone can slide against the surface of another bone, and they have to be smooth in order to achieve the free movement, the frictionless movement that is necessary for this articulation to work well. So wherever we find a movable articulation, we are going to see smooth surfaces. And here on these vertebrae, because they tend to be somewhat small and confined to a relatively small area, they are referred to as facets. So this particular facet, because it's on the superior articular process, would be called the superior articular facet. To get a better understanding of how these articulations work, let's look at these four thoracic vertebrae that are articulated with one another. First of all, remember that the bodies of the vertebrae are articulated with one another by means of intervertebral discs, which are not depicted here in this illustration, but they would be located right here in between the bodies. This type of articulation permits some degree of movement, not free movement, but some degree of movement. So we're going to get some degree of movement and in the thoracic region, what you're going to primarily see is flexion, extension, and hyperextension. So we are going to see this kind of movement as a result of the articulation between the vertebral bodies. Now at the same time, you have on the posterior side of these vertebrae, remember, the neural arches, which are now linked with one another by articulations. The neural arch forms the spinal canal, which is going to protect the spinal cord. And this is a protective encasement, but we need this protective encasement to have some degree of mobility as the vertebral column flexes and extends.
And this mobility is going to be achieved by these articulations between the articular processes of succeeding vertebrae. And the nature of the movement between the articulations is going to be determined by the orientation of the facets. Using this marvelous 3D image that comes by way of Eric Bauer and other individuals at Elon University, let's take a closer look at the superior articular processes on this thoracic vertebra and note the location of the superior articular facets. These facets are going to articulate with the inferior articular facets of the thoracic vertebra that is superior to it. If we turn this vertebra around and look at the inferior articular processes, we'll find the inferior articular facets. And again, these inferior articular facets are going to articulate with the superior articular facets of the vertebra that is inferior to this vertebra. If we return to our vertebral column and look along the length of the vertebral column and, and how the vertebrae change as we go from the cervical region to the sacral region, we'll note that the orientation of these articular processes are going to be modified to reflect the movement that needs to be accommodated in each region. So as an example, let's concentrate on the lumbar region. And here we can see our five lumbar vertebrae. Here is an isolated vertebra where, again, we can see the superior and inferior articular processes. And note here that the articular facet on this superior articular process has a different orientation. It is facing medially and is more in the sagittal plane than what we saw with the thoracic vertebra. This reflects the fact that in the lumbar region of the vertebral column, the type of movement you're going to see more of will be twisting movements, torsion, and lateral flexion. Also note that the facet is not really that flat. It's concave here and somewhat elliptical in shape. And this is the type of articulation that we're going to see when we look at articulations that permits movement in two different planes. Again, in this case, we'll have movement around the central axis of the vertebral column torsion and laterally with, with lateral flexion. So if we again take advantage of the marvelous 3D image by Eric Bauer and undergraduate associates at Elon University, we can note that when we look at closely at the superior articular processes, we can see the superior articular facets, which again are somewhat concave and elliptical. And if we turn to the, this lumbar vertebra around and take a look at the inferior articular facets, which are going to be articulating with the our superior articular facets of the neighboring lumbar vertebrae, we can note that these facets are now convex and still somewhat elliptical in shape. Now let's finish this video by looking at the processes which are not going to give us articulations but which are necessary for attachment, for strength, and for movement. These processes extend from the neural arch and we are going to attach ligaments to them and muscles. So here is a thoracic vertebrae, and if we look more closely at the neural arch, we'll note that there is one process extending from the top of the neural arch, and this process is called the spinous process. If we look at this vertebrae from the side, we can see that on the thoracic vertebrae, these processes can be somewhat long and tend to point inferiorly. Also on the same vertebrae, we have extending from the place where the pedicles meet the laminae of the neural arch, the transverse processes. So we have a pair of transverse processes extending from the sides of the neural arch. Finally, let's look at a lumbar vertebra and look at the same processes.
So here we can see again our superior articular processes and in inferiorly we have our inferior articular processes. Extending from, again from the top of the neural arch we have our spinous process which in the lumbar vertebra which is somewhat wider and shorter. And extending again from the sides of the neural arch we have our transverse processes. This brings our video to an end. If you'd like to take a quiz, there is a link in the description below. Here are the image attributions. Most of the images were in the public domain. And finally, here is Apollo finding a snack by the water cooler.